The entire day is about value and how we end up making decisions within the complex field of contemporary art market. Besides the already established ethical questions of conservation in general, there are so many more things to look into. What does it mean for us when artworks become a commodity or an investment? What are the expectations of the collector, which means when is a less perfect condition acceptable and how does one deal with a rather short lifespan of certain materials? The terms devaluation and total loss come to mind. Our next guest is an expert in these questions and will offer a variety of perspectives drawn from her wide experience. Reni Vara works as a private curator, art advisor, and appraiser for 20th century and contemporary art. Her previous engagements was with Chubb Insurance as a fine art specialist. She's a member of the Appraisers <laughs> Association of America and has held lectures at NYU, Guggenheim Museum, and Sotheby's Institute. Please join me in welcoming Reni Vara. Thank you. Hopefully I won't be an experiment in ephemeral nature and you'll see me. It's at least cooled down today, this afternoon. So um, just to start, uh, when Christian and I were trying to approach how to focus this topic, um, it was a big challenge for me because it's a lot of content. So what I'd like to do is ask a bit of forgiveness because what I'm going to do is kind of talk about things that are seemingly banal but I know they will contextualize a lot of um, the discussion earlier in the symposium. And then I'll try to circle back and discuss how it relates to the art market and decision-making processes. And some challenges and questions um, we're all largely confronted with when dealing with these issues. So the damage and loss process. Um, every damage is unique, obviously. And, but its settlement great, greatly varies. When I mean settlement, I mean the actual legal process of paying a claim. Um, it's not normalized, the process, and there are protocols that the insurance companies themselves um, hold with themselves, but they vary greatly. And they don't only vary greatly with insurance companies, they vary greatly with artists, with artist estates, with conservators, with appraisers, and certainly with collectors. So because of that, it creates a, a very dynamic situation every time we're approaching it. Um, there's often little consensus amongst valuation experts. I would say this is becoming even more extreme um, because uh, many, many people in the field now are working as generalists rather than specialists in c contemporary art and post-war. Um, and I think that, you know, I would advocate that this is not a good situation um, for the artwork, the artist, um, or the collector. Uh, it is very specific to the object. It is case by case. And some of the considerations are the specific object characteristics and material, which we've discussed at length. And you can see all the challenges that present themselves. The artists themselves, their brand power, the marketplace, their representation, um, the type of damage, the quality of the treatment, um, which varies greatly, um, both in, usually in its intent, it's always well intended, but it doesn't necessarily mean, like a surgeon, um, that it's the best process or best approach taken. Um, the durability of the treatment, which is always a big question mark when we're evaluating um, devaluation or a settlement case. Um, how much it's stabilized, as we know materials perform much um, differently in the future than sometimes we anticipate. Um, and collectors, especially collectors who are um, owners uh, or even institutions, uh, you know, sometimes you can't anticipate this. But we try to the best we can to assess all of these components. Um, an objective outcome of treatment versus the perception of the treatment. I often have uh, collectors who say things like, the magic is lost. I really have to get our arms around what the notion of the magic is. Um, because many collectors are rather whimsical in um, what they want to accept as, a, um, as, as a, a limit of condition. And it's often in opposition what 
with what professionals may say, like conservators or appraisers or auction house specialists or collectors, other collectors or other curators. And oftentimes this creates a whole different trajectory of how those claims are handled. But it's, it's really important to try to piece those things out very clearly. Um, insurance companies, internal standards, really their process and their procedures are oftentimes um, so variable it's hard to anticipate um, until the time of the loss. Uh, specific language of the insurance policy, covered losses and exclusions. I know there was lots of discussions about you know, who gets to make these decisions. So I just wanted to say very quickly, it is a complex process. It is often confusing. It is a process that's largely not an academic one. We're not kind of trained in these areas as professionals whether it be in graduate school, it is one largely um, that is engaged in within the insurance industry, and it is one um, that is evolving as well. Um, and they're trying to figure out as, as much as, you know, conservators are trying to figure out how to treat certain materials. But basically, a work gets damaged. It's reported to an insurance broker. Christian wanted me to make clear people's roles, because the truth is, I often help collectors because it seems so overwhelming what role, what professional is playing, they feel um, very vulnerable. Um, you know, and then the claim is reported to the insurance company. An insurance broker and an insurance company are very different people. The simplistic thing is the insurance company writes the check. The broker helps advise the client. Pre-treatment uh, pre of the damage, um, what we call uh, post-loss state is a conservator receives the works, creates a pretreatment report. The appraiser at the same time receives the information regarding the work, examines the object, reviews the report, and consults with the conservator. The appraiser or the valuation expert um, really should be in the best practice scenario involved from the beginning. Um, and obviously documentation prior to loss is essential. I can say on the private client side as, uh, side, as much as we see so much professional discussion about collection management, it's, it's often um, not in existence. Um, and then an insurance company obviously receives the conservator's treatment report and approves the conservation. Um, most insurance companies cover conservation costs, as you may know. So this is uh, the process of post-treatment. And as you can see, the conservator treats the work and issues an after-treatment report. These reports are essential to the process. Um, I know many conservators who are a little intimidated um, in writing these reports. Um, and I think that one should not dismiss how important your opinion is as a conservator, if you're acting as a conservator, is in the process you really are one of the most reliable sources in regards to its treatment outcome, its stability, and the processes you undertook. And it's intent, especially for if it's a living artist, and, and how, how faithful it is. But I know that's difficult. Um, the appraiser obviously is gonna be examining the work as well as a second set of eyes to the conservator, um, leaning very, very closely on the conservator's ideas and thoughts. And then the appraiser completes what's called a loss damage report, um, which assigns a percentage loss in value. So a lot of these um, very open-ended uh, works are subject to a very specific conclusion. And um, no matter how large these reports are, you know, 70, 100 page, the first thing people flip to is that percentage loss in value. And people really bottom line a lot of this rather than looking at some of the nuances, but which makes it kind of contentious. Um, not always, but often. Uh, report is shared and reviewed. It's got, it goes to the insurance company, the insurance broker, and the client owner. Uh, the insurance company, in they could be an adjuster, an independent adjuster, or an in-house claims adjuster. Um, they really determine the claim and the settlement. Now, obviously the settlement that is reached has to be agreed to by the owner. Um, I think John will speak after me a lot about VARA and, and the role. So the valuation process, the claims and settlement is a legal binding agreement 
as is the specific insurance contract. So these specific insurance contracts, you can have a discussion on a curatorial level or a conservation level or an artistic practice level. But at the end of the day, when we're actually talking about this formalized process, it is very subject to that language. Um, and it's legal and it's a binding agreement between the client and the insurance company. Um, there are great differences between personal insurance and commercial insurance. There's different de definitions of what fine arts are, what it includes, what it excludes, what's a covered loss, um, what kind of exclusions, even in a covered loss, may be in play. And also, um, what, which is you know most difficult, is issues of valuation clause. And um, as a, a bit of a valuation geek, this is where things get very murky and, and mucky, and I'll explain why. Um, so we talked about partial losses and total loss. I just want to make a couple comments. Uh, a partial loss is where the payout to the claim or to the client is less than the total value of the object. The object does remain in the hands of the owner or the collector or the institution, and the object is theoretically devalued uh, to some extent. Obviously, the percentage um, you know, that we determine uh, specifies to what extent. A total loss is a full payout to the policy limits of, uh, for that object. The ownership, and this is essential, the ownership does typically transfer to the insurance company at that point. Um, and that is a formal process um, that is subject to sign-offs. You know, theoretically, the object has, to has lost all value. Um, it's salvage, and uh, you know how that conclusion is arrived at is a, is a different discussion. But it is subject to VARA, so you know insurance companies have to be mindful of VARA. Um, but it's also important to understand that many, many situations I'm seeing now, and I can say these are institutional collectors, um, really big-minded collectors, um, collectors who have large collections that are either historic or emerging, um, you know, their role is also part of sometimes what becomes a total loss. So it's not necessarily that the work um, is fully damaged, meaning it's lost all historical merit or historical value or even market value. It means the insurance company has paid for the full value. So valuation reports are theoretically adhered to USPAP. Everyone knows USPAP here, right? Yes, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Um, it's actually very important if you don't know what that is and you are working on in these circumstances um, with a valuation case that you do understand that, most importantly, that is the only um, codified methodology that's out there in terms of valuation proceedings. And it might not be important in the upfront or if everything goes well in regard to the settlement of the claim, but if it doesn't, it can be um, problematic. So if you're either hiring someone or working in tandem with someone, it's very important that they be USPAP tested. Because if it goes to court, that will be the first thing that will be discussed because it is the only methodology that's uniform. And even within that uniform methodology, there's so much variance. Um, so you don't want to start um, basically not conforming to the one kind of code that exists out there. Um, so the legal, once the loss in value report is issued, um, it, it, it's issued by an independent party from the transaction, meaning if the work has been bought or sold at any point during its lifetime, theoretically, that valuation uh, expert should not be handling that work in general. It should be an arms away approach. And again, if it goes to court, or if it goes to litigation or arbitration, um, questions of ethics will come up if someone's in, in, you know, involved. Collections that I have privately curated on long-term basis, I have hired other uh, appraisers to execute when something was damaged, well, even though I knew the most possible about these works over a long period of time, just because um, it allowed for a much more independent, objective um, perspective. And it was very helpful in the whole process. Um, as I said, it's not always executed by an appraiser. I think many people that are within the marketplace, obviously auction house specialists, dealers, um, estate managers, they know the marketplace um, and they're not to be discredited. Uh, 
The only problem is if they don't understand the standards of writing these very technical reports, it could compromise the claim. Um, a good appraiser is taking into consideration and speaking to all those people um, that are essential to the valuation. Um, the document is really at the center. So although in, in, in this process, I showed it as a linear process, actually the appraiser should be in the middle of a circle and then everyone should radiate out. That's probably a better um, pictorial of what the process is like. And largely you have to be Switzerland because there is so much push and pull during the process. Um, but either way you should be consulting um, you know, important dealers, estate managers, the artist, um, auction house specialists if there's some reason you're trying to get your arms around a comparable. Um, but it really in the best practice requires specific expertise because especially in contemporary art, it is moving so quickly the marketplace and has so many pockets and is now international, it's largely difficult for a generalist to get underneath. Also quite simply, much of the transactions in the art world, as you know, I think uh, the TFAF report uh, by Claire McAndrews just suggested that 52% of all the art transactions happening um, are private. So they're not disclosed. So you can't just look up an art net and understand an artist's marketplace. Um, that's a very limited viewpoint. And largely, um, you may derive an inaccurate value. Um, you also need to follow artists and, and be within the marketplace to have a kind of insider's edge to what's happening. Um, it must be a covered loss due to physical damage. And, you know, the report creates a conclusion that looks something like that. It's $300,000, it's 20%, the loss in value is 60%, the insurance settlement was 60% plus conservation and any other fees. Now, this is where it gets sticky. Um, the insurance company language in the actual policy typically reads this way. Uh, three types of valuation clauses, agreed amount, market value, and extended replacement value. Anyone heard of these things? Yes, market value maybe, right? Um, these are not defined necessarily. Um, extended replacement value is solely a product of the competitive high-end fine art marketplace. Um, I watched it evolve and it's, it's really difficult. But simply, extended replacement value is if the client insures it for $10,000, at the time of loss, if the work has appreciated, they actually can collect up to $15,000. So that may not seem like a very wide range of values, but imagine a $10 million piece that now the insurance company is looking at a $15 million claim. Or imagine a whole collection, which is worth $200 million, and it's now subject to $350 million. It opens a can of worms for debate um, because it is, it is really um, difficult. And the only thing that kind of formalizes it is that you have to look at in the, the loss in a timeline, and the timeline is at the time of loss. So you have to kind of create a window, which is usually hypothetical, going backwards in terms of establishing value. But nevertheless, it's very, very subject to, date, to, to bait. Market value is very general as it's defined. It is not what USPAP defines as, as market value. Um, agreed amount is $5,000 is $5,000. No more, no less. Um, market value, if it says market value, is it capped? May not be. Um, and then depending on where they settle it from, the contents policy or the fine arts and policy, there's a whole nother element. So if it sounds like a bit squishy, it actually is. Um, so USPAP values are very firmly defined, fair market value being the price at which property would change hands between, between a willing buyer and a willing seller, with neither party being under any compulsion to buy or sell, and both having reasonable knowledge and relevant of the facts. This is what they use for IRS donations. This is what they use for charitable gift. Um, it's sometimes what's used for... Um, claims and devaluation, but again, it's fair market value. It's not market value. Um, re retail replacement is actually what typically insurance companies on the personal property side, so private insurance, not institutional insurance, 
um, uses for valuation standards. And it's the highest amount in terms of U.S. dollars that would be required to replace a property with another similar age, quality, origin, appearance, and provenance um, within a reasonable length of time. Um, this can be obviously considerably higher than market value. Market value or fair market value theoretically is a trading number, you know, buyer and seller at that moment. Replacement value takes this concept and makes it even more theoretical and says, okay, so you lost your Picasso. Uh, with that, it's going to take a while to find a replacement. And we can't just walk out the door and necessarily buy it. Um, we certainly can't buy it at auction. We might have to call 20 dealers. And of those 20 dealers, one dealer may have something that's similar in quality and um, historical merit and style. And whatever that dealer wants to sell it for, theoretically, that's the replacement value. So obviously, you know how the art world works. It's supply and demand um, with a very rarefied work. This can be considerably different. Um, and then with a commoditized work or an emerging artist, we can see great gaps between the retail value, what you would buy it at the gallery, and if a young artist goes to auction, what it may sell for at auction. Um, so the basic point I'm trying to make without being, uh, without being too unsexy is that these <laughs> gaps are huge. The language is different, the, eth you know, the approach is different, the values are different, and the appraiser in the midst of this. So really what the appraiser or the valuation expert must do, um, uh, beyond all doubt, is establish exactly which valuation they're going to use as a basis for their appraisal. And that usually requires understanding the policy, reaching out to the right people, and um, getting it documented how you're supposed to value the work to begin with. Um, you know, and then, you know, the loss in value, LIV, could be anywhere from 5 to 50%. And this is how it would look. Usually when we start hitting 50% loss in value, and again, this is a standard more on the insurance side than the art world side, 50% um, is starting to rub against the notion of, a total loss. Now, a total loss, I'm using that word only in terms of a payout and a claim. Um, and it can be determined by many, many factors, including the artist's request, the dealer's request, the estate or artist denying um, that it's representative of their work, um, or the client request. And none of this necessarily um, has, you know, necessarily correlates with what maybe a curator's opinion is, a conservator's opinion, or even the marketplace opinion. So ultimately, the loss is settled with the insurance company and the owner. Um, and Christian asked me, well, how, how do you derive value? So deriving value is a complex analysis of factors. Um, you have to assess the drivers of the art market and the artist marketplace. Like all market, it is really subject to supply and demand relationship. There's considerations for the artist brand power, as uh, obnoxious as that may sound. Um, it is out there in the world. Um, the volume of sales, the result of the sales, where the sales exist, what we call the most relevant marketplace. Um, and then the actual object. So many people, what I see on the advisory, on the advisory side, um, many new collectors in particular get caught up in the brand power. But obviously, we all know that there's a lot more than the brand power. Artists create great works, mediocre works, and terrible works. And so obviously, you know, after you're looking at the entire context, the landscape of the marketplace, you're also going to be looking at the actual work itself, the connoisseurship, uh, the comparables that exist out there of uh, like kind and quality objects that have sold. Um, and here's an example of, of and it's, it's very difficult for me to show images of, of items. I'm sure conservators are also involved in a similar issue. But uh, uh, one example is a Manzoni, 
that I was involved with. And as many of you may know, kaolin was a process that derived from ceramics, but Manzoni came up with his own recipes and often changed his recipes and a lot of the materials in different um, years he was approaching it um, transformed and changed. And so this was an impact damage. Somebody bumped into it, I think, in the living room. And it was central to the piece, meaning in the area of visibility. And when it was treated, the outcomes were very, very positive. And there was no black lighting uh, that resulted uh, to the greatest extent. It was documented by the conservator um, using all the kind of standard ethics and approaches. And the, because the areas of damage um, were not visible, um, in that case, we might consider the valuation or the devaluation to be minimal. Um, now, there is an argument that many make that the work was perfect before, and it's no longer perfect due to this physical occurrence, this car accident, this scar on the work. And um, that is a legitimate concern. And oftentimes, appraisers should be considering that. I do think sometimes for very rarefied works that are uh, museum quality artists, um, that over time, those damages become less valuable, meaning the market will accept, just like an old master's painting, the market will accept that this work is older and older and it's not going to be in perfect condition. So over time, for, for many works that can be um, you know, successfully treated, um, the impact of that uh, value damage, I think, is, is, is going to decrease. It's kind of like an arc that goes down like this. Um, so obviously with Manzoni, some of the, the challenges, the experimental nature of his materials, um, you know, the, the materials themselves, is it an exact match? How will they age? The two materials aging differently and separately, um, it being a monochromatic work and having a certain appearance that was, you know, on a holistic level consistent um, and it not necessarily having that in five years. Um, and a more general question is obviously did it preserve the concept, the integrity of the work, the aesthetics of the work, as we were just discussing with some of the sound installations, um, or was it returned to its original pre-law state, um, either partially or fully? Um, is the work destabilized to some extent because of the damage or the treatment? I have seen unsuccessful treatments just like we see with surgeons, um, I've seen lots of botched jobs, unfortunately. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be remedied, but I, I do see that, and that changes um, the work. Uh, what extent can the treatment be perceived, and to what extent will the marketplace accept it or not? Um, separate from the collector, there's the whole world of the art market. So are they going to accept a certain, you know, bandwidth of damage to an artwork, you'll be surprised how much is accepted and absorbed into the art marketplace. And I know this is very different for institutional collections, but um, I think because the you know art market is just expanding exponentially every day, there are so few people that actually even know how to evaluate condition. It really flies under the wire. Um, is the post-law state the same as the pre-law state? Does the hand of another, and we were addressing this earlier, uh, transform the authenticity or what I would call the aura of the art? So as the collector you know, suggested to me with one of his um, works, the magic was gone. And um, it, it was really tough because I actually thought the work was quite, quite magical. And um, you know, in that case, because of the client, uh, there was a total loss determined on that work. Um, so here's another example that actually Christian and I were involved with, and I, I like to show this, and I show it often because, um, first of all, I can speak about it because it's been published. Uh, this was a uh, diptych, a conceptual piece, and it was two parts, obviously, and it was damaged by water, and when Christian approached it, uh, the, the buckles in the surface um, could not be eliminated. It was monochromatic with a small kind of a figurative thing. Uh, it was a figurative, uh, a figurative, I'm trying to think now, Oof. 
uh, it was a while ago, in the center, but largely the painting was covered um, in a monochromatic surface. And the mold stains could not be limited. Uh, Christian thought it might be unstable in the wrong conditions. Um, and those mold stains were very obvious from the front, the side, the back. If somebody just flipped the work, they could easily perceive it. And so it was deemed a total loss. That's another example across the stretcher of the mold stains. The mold stains. So this was um, sent to the world to salvage. Maybe that's heaven or hell for paintings. I'm not sure. Um, and how this got there is a bit of a mystery. I mean, it isn't in that here we had a great consensus, but um, who made the final determination, whether it was the collector's request or the insurance company, I'm not sure, and I will probably never know. Um, and that's, that's one thing, you know, myth busting. Many collectors think I have an essential hand into making these decisions, but actually, you know, the appraisers are purposely independent because insurance companies want the process to be separate, um, arms away from their internal um, proceedings. And um, although I've been privy to many internal discussions and obviously experienced that when I was working at Chubb, uh, oftentimes I don't even find out the settlement sometimes a year or two after. So I am not empowered and neither is the conservator. Um, Obviously, salvage, you know, probably should not return to the market. I think it's a, a, a tremendous amount of awareness around that now. I would say 15 years ago, it was very difficult for me to explain that. Um, but now it's, it's changed. So I just want to show a couple quick things. I do think uh, the insurance world and the contemporary art world are slightly at odds because of the experimental nature. Um, here, inherent damage, inherent vice are exclusions on the insurance policies. And here's an example of Tam Van Tram, a uh, pop explosion. These pieces of um, leaf, gold leaf, are just falling off. And, um, you know, Ansel Kiefer's work, which obviously uh, is stable, but oftentimes changes uh, because of its alchemy, um, its nature and the materials he used. Uh, Tracy Emmons' bed, soiled condoms, panties, everything of that sort, they're already contaminated. Repurposed materials we see over and over, like Shanique Smith, where you know the, the, we don't even know the original condition of the works being installed, included within the bales that she creates. Um, Dan Colon, I hear a lot of conservators talk to me about the saliva and the issue and the patina of the age. And then you have artists such as Vim DeVoy who was working with live, live animals and tattooing them. So, you know, where do you put the insurance number on, on that um, in terms of its uh, ephemeral nature? So all of this brings up a lot of questions, um, and I hope that it lays a little bit of a foundation for context for discussion. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Louise Cohn. Um, I just have a question about that what you mentioned that there's a curve um, of where conservation work kind of means less and less when you get into the older historical artworks in terms of value. Um, do you find that there's a different ethical kind of like considerations when you're evaluating a really contemporary art piece that is still in its younger days um, as compared to an older piece that has a certain historicity about it? I mean, you mentioned the client um, that they felt that the magic was gone. That seems like a very emotional response, and maybe you wouldn't see that necessarily in an in an older piece. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm quoting him, but I knew him quite well. So, um, in terms of ethics, I'm not sure how to what the exact question is. I mean, I think you're supposed to approach both the same. What I'm saying is because rarity drives the market so much, and that's why you see Giacometti's selling for $120 million, um, that historical works have that benefit because you're not going to necessarily be able to find another example of a historic work that's iconic. And so, you know, um, Picasso's work that the casino owner owned is a, is, a, is a perfect example. He put his arm, La Reve, the dream, through it, 
And, uh, you know, reportedly he ended up selling it for more, maybe three or five years later, than what the insurance settlement was going to be and what the current after the damage. And as you know, that was an announcement he was making for a sale price, right? So it was such an iconic work and so irreplaceable. I think that over time, there might be a, a more, a, a greater acceptance, just like we accept a lot of old master's pieces. They have lives. And there's no good examples. And certainly on the private collecting side, if many artworks are in an institution, they don't have much choice if they want to have uh, an example. So, um, but at the end of the day, really with this valuation concern, when you're doing a loss or, or settlement, uh, you really have to try to nail it to a timeline. And the, you know that you cannot project in a future way. Um, you have to think about it and be conscious of it in terms of what level and whether you, you know, call it a total damage. Um, but you theoretically are not supposed to be. You're supposed to be looking at it at the time of loss, what the value was, um, and to what extent it's compromised it. So, y you know, it's not a perfect si system. It's very theoretical, and there's a lot of unknowns, and that's a bit of the art behind it. Um, it's also subject to an extreme amount of negotiation, not necessarily on the conservator side or the appraiser side, but certainly with all other parties. Um, hello, this is Robin Clark. Um, my question for you has to do with your, the phrase you used toward the end of your talk about the world of salvage. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit what that looks like? I mean, is, it, is there a particular protocol that everything should adhere to once that state is achieved, or are there a range of possibilities? Um, I have seen it handled many ways, um, but most often, I think, you know, if I were involved in the advocacy, those works are returned uh, to the artist or the artist's estate if possible, um, so they don't recirculate into the marketplace unknowingly. Um, I, I have seen that insurance companies are so much better at dealing with this, um, both in terms of their process as well as their respect. Um, over the last 15 years. So in general, I haven't seen many items uh, resurface that shouldn't have. However, there are these times when these huge, huge damage situations occur, when you have like a 10,000 square foot home that is um, burned by, you know, burned and smoke damage, and there's just thousands of items that need to be removed, and a salvage company is brought in. Um, and they, you know, basically clean and remove it. And you'd be surprised. It's shocking, but even sometimes the client themselves don't remember what they owned. Um, and that seems very difficult to understand or appreciate as, you know, art caretakers. But you, you would be surprised. And so sometimes I have seen things recirculate, but it's not necessarily on purpose, but salvage gets taken, the salvage companies takes away these huge massive thing, then sometimes it gets sold off, and then it recirculates and pops up. But, you know, certainly an active artist or an artist's estate, I mean, every auction house specialist I know, you know, separate from a tag sale, uh, would call that out if, if, if it was brought to their attention. I'm sorry, we have yep. to break. Okay, <laughs> sorry, we can speak later. Thank you.